Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I shall be answering questions from the Battle of Chintoka. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so the first question is from The Real S. Blair. How do you see the war concluding if Section 31 either didn't exist or were not involved? This is quite an interesting question. The main involvement of Section 31 is, of course, in the creation of the Changeling Plague. Now, there's a lot of realities to the war that are not going to be altered by this. The, the Gamma Quadrant being cut off by the Prophets is one of these realities. However, there are a lot of decisions that are made later in the war by the Founder, which maybe weren't the most uh, rational or sensible of decisions. Indeed, one of those decisions could arguably be bringing the Breen into the war. It's something that really does kind of reek of desperation from the Dominion and the desire to win the war quickly. I think that's the big thing. Um, the, the founders were very much, uh, you know, seeking to win the war quickly before they all died out. Take the Federation down before they themselves were destroyed. Now, with that in mind you can see why they got the Breen involved. However, if there was no plague, maybe the Breen wouldn't have been involved, or the Breen would have come in later, and the founders would have probably stuck to a more defensive strategy and continued building up forces within the Cardassian Union. And in all likelihood, that would have probably um, kept them in the fight for, at the very least, longer, if not maybe won them the war. That may have been a fatal decision. Uh, that's really quite hard to tell, but certainly bringing the Breen into the war and then immediately going on the offensive very much reeks of desperation and just shows how irrational the decision-making was by the founders. Not only that, but of course their decisions to consistently uh, snub and humiliate the Cardassians. That wasn't great either, and again, the founders really shot themselves in the foot there. Alexander Leach asks, so what's next after? Right, well, those of you who have seen the Apocalypse trailer will know that there's a few battles I plan on covering, and some I didn't disclose. But I'm going to go off a particular theme, shall we say the Four Horsemen, so to speak. So the next episode will probably be Septimus Three, which I know is going to surprise an awful lot of people. But yes, I'm going to cover the Battle of Septimus III before we get to the Battle of Earth. That's obviously the one a lot of people are very interested in, and rightly so. It's a very interesting event, and I will cover that. But Septimus III is also very important, and there's something there that I think needs to be shown. That's all I'll say from there. From Kieran Hines, two main questions. What are some of the Breen ships we see at the end? They look like different versions of the main Breen cruiser, and not unlike some you've shown off before. And the second question is, why did you have a small portion of the Klingon fleet escape with survivors instead of only one bird of prey, like it was in the original episode? So to answer the first question, um, in terms of Breen ships, I won't go too in-depth into it, but I did do a breakdown like last year on the Breen ship and its various components and how am I speculation that it is actually a modular design and here we see the three modular variants so we have the standard Chelgret, we have what I'm going to call the Crab which is actually a pursuit version, it's lighter and faster, it has four warp nacelles and the Lancer which has two of those prongs and these are more symmetrical designs and I'll go more in depth into it in Breen Doctrine and how these ships fit in and what their tactics and employment are. But the other ships present of the battle were the Plesh Breck Destroyer, and the command ship was a Sar Theln class heavy cruiser. Yeah, I'll cover that in more depth in a true Breen fleet breakdown. And in terms of why I had the Klingon fleet escape, well, if one Klingon ship was the only one to escape, then how on earth did they get all their escape pods, you know, filled with all the crews of the wrecked starships? How did they all get back to Deep Space Nine? So, to me, it seemed more sensible that a greater number of Klingon ships survived. 
is described in the episode. If the Breen's re- if the Breen noticed that one of their one of the Klingon ships was unaffected, they'd probably go, "Oh, all Klingon ships are immune." Oh, shoot! Um, don't stop it! Don't let them! Don't let them realize that we can't actually hurt them. So, I think it very much works. You've got to bear in mind the Breen psychology. The Breen very much know that they are getting into a heavyweight fight, and they are very very underweight, and they can't overplay their hand. They actually only have a very small box of tricks from which to draw. And they can't let their own allies, let alone their enemies, realise that it is actually quite a small box of tricks that they have uh, to their name. Which, funnily enough, follows on to Shannon Carter's question. Is it fair to say the Breen are one-trick ponies? Their energy-dampening weapon was essentially their only means of superiority, and when it was undone they were left just as vulnerable as the Jem'Hadar or Cardassians. Yes and no. I, I, you know, yes, I've made the point that the Breen only have uh, a small box of tricks. However, they do have a very unique box of tricks, and the energy damper is just one part of this. The Breen kind of benefit from being outside of the conventional military structure and doctrines of the Alpha and Beta Quadrant. They aren't. They don't operate like a normal military they operate as small groups of pirates. Now, when it comes to large-scale fleet actions, this means that they are left wanting. They are often under tonnage and undergunned. Their ships are very, very, very flimsy, but their ships are also very, very fast. And this gives them an awful lot of advantage, especially in the offense. They don't have to fight in the same conventional order that the Cardassians or Jem'Hadar do. They can fight in extremely fluid and not even fluid, aggressive formations. And that's kind of the strength of the Breen. So I wouldn't it wouldn't be fair to say that they were purely reliant on their energy damper. They did have tactics outside of it. The energy damper was one part of it, and it was a very, very useful weapon. But it was hardly the only trick up their sleeve. The Breen ships, as I say, they're very fast, they're very manoeuvrable, and they are used to operating very independently. And actually, that's also defensively, you've got to think about, that's a very good counter to what the Federation is developing, particularly with a lot of independent frigate wings that are going to go in. Ships like the Intrepid and Luna, you know, these aggressive reconnaissance ships, which we've mentioned, you know, the best counter to those are not going to be the Jem'Hadar formations, which can only kind of move in swarms and are very obvious, and it's not going to be the Cardassian formations, which are very static and regimented. It's going to be the Breen, because the Breen have that ability and that understanding of how to move and fight on the move and very rapidly and unpredictably. Harper Steele asks, Why do you hate the Camarag and want it dead? I will point out that I did not show the Camarag in this episode. I did not show the Camarag getting blown up. That might change next episode. But what I will actually make a mention of is the Camarag is fundamentally the last attempt at doing the old D-style battlecruiser, whether that's the D6, D4, you know, D7, those kind of battlecruisers. The Vodshar is a completely novel design. Yes, there's some overlap with the Camarag, and the Camarag made the Vodchar possible, but the Vodchar is a fundamentally new philosophy. And it is interesting, in all these Dominion War battles that I've been depicting, how good the Vodchar really is. It's a damn solid ship. You've got to really think about a Vodchar, you think about a full Vodchar wing. Two gun Vodchars, torpedo Vodchar, and a command ship. That can take on... I mean, easily take on a single Jem'Hadar battle group. I'd hazard as far as to say it can probably take on two Dominion battle groups, possibly even three. That's probably straining it a lot, uh, but definitely two. Uh, the Vocha, by virtue of its specialization, allows it to achieve disproportionate results. You compare it to the Dominion battle cruiser. The Dominion Battlecruiser is a fairly well-rounded battlecruiser, but it's not an extremist build. 
The Vochas are all extremist builds, so the Disruptor Vocha has an absurdly powerful Disruptor. We are talking, you know, in excess of what the Dominion Battlecruiser can achieve. Again, same thing with the Torpedo Vocha. Far superior rates of torpedo fire than the Jem'Hadar Battlecruiser, because the Jem'Hadar Battlecruiser is a torpedo gunship, a phaser platform, and a command ship. It's got to be all three things. And the Vochas each focus on just doing one thing really well. And that's why they were consistently outperforming the older Camarags, which were, again, very generalist. And the Klingons realized that that kind of generalist style of starship was not viable anymore. Next is from Mr. Gunlover. Was the Romulans not sharing bases with the Federation like the Klingons were a decision made by the Federation or the Romulans? And were the Romulans allowed to be treated by Federation hospital ships? So, in terms of not sharing bases, that was very much a sort of uh, practical decision made largely by the Romulans. The Klingons run on antimatter, as do the Federation. The Romulans don't. So the Romulans really don't ever see the need for, for bases in the way that the Federation and the Klingons do. And the f infrastructure at these bases is not really that helpful for Romulan warbirds. Um, you know, the, the most they can aid in is very basic levels of repair and, you know, replenishment. But even then, the Romulan warbirds are kind of designed in such a way that they can do that self-sufficiently. You know, a Romulan warbird that's taken a little bit of damage, it's just going to go find a quiet place in deep space and then launch all its work bees and its various auxiliary craft and just get to work on fixing itself. It's got the capacity to do that due to its huge size. It has to do that because it doesn't necessarily know that it will be able to make a base. So a base is nice, but it's not necessary for the Romulan Warbird, whereas it is necessary for the Federation and the Klingons. And so in many ways, the Romulans can often be bumped down in the queue because they have their own independent capability. They bring it with them. Now, when it comes to Romulans being treated on Federation hospital ships, again, warbirds carry with them their own large medical facilities for much the same reasons. However, these warbirds were not the ones transporting wounded personnel back to Romulus. This would generally be done by smaller transport ships, smaller transport ships which didn't have those kind of medical facilities, and so that's why Romulan soldiers would often die in transit. It would be fair to say that while the Federation do have a reasonable understanding of Romulan biology, it's not enough to treat them en masse. And again, the Romulans are just better off handling it themselves. You know, the Klingons similarly uh, wouldn't make colossal use of Federation hospital ships because their approach to medicine is very, very different. Uh, now, it's a complete uh, misconception that the Klingons don't practice medicine and just, oh, my, I've hurt my back, you've got to kill me. No, that's not how the Klingons work. But it's a very, very different and very much more rugged and uh, abrupt practice of medicine than that in the Federation. You know, the Federation, they want to, re they want to rehabilitate you. Not just to f fight the next battle, but also to live the rest of your life. The Klingons are less interested in that. So whatever they can do to get soldiers back into action, that's the kind of medical paths they will take, rather than complete rehabilitation. You know, if they have to give him, like, an, a, uh, a robot leg that will break down eventually, but it'll get him into the next battle where he can die with honor. Solid. So the next question is from Colrez Wesker. Do you think you'll ever do a video about the Breen attack on Earth? And the answer to that is absolutely. 
Yes, it's one of the episodes I will do as part of this Apocalypse series. So that is definitely one I will do in the future because it's a very interesting event that is actually not covered all that much. We're told it's happened, we're told that it happens, but we don't know how it happened. So that's definitely something worth exploring. And again, that will tell us an awful lot more about the Breen. Mr. Gunlover also asks, what inspired you to have most of the vessels being salvageable? So a combination of things. Uh, firstly, the fact that in a lot of space battles depicted in sci-fi, it's always done that, oh, the ship was completely destroyed. Because that's easiest from both a visual standpoint and a writing standpoint. It's a loose end tied up. However, most naval battles don't play out like that. Most naval battles end with ships being wrecked and still being able to be salvaged. So that was one aspect. Another aspect was the footage from the actual battle sequence of Chintoka, where we see the weapon platforms open fire on the ships. And there's an awful lot of ships in very bad condition, don't get me wrong. They are badly hit by those weapon platforms. But very few of them are completely exploded. Very few of them actually take a direct hit to the warp core. And my thinking in terms of why this is, is because the weapon platforms are working to neutralize the threat first. And they are going down in sort of order of what is closest and what is most threatening, what ships are the most powerful. And it's doing it in such a way as to render those ships inert rather than to actually destroy them. Because to destroy them would take longer and that's time that they should be actually spending engaging another vessel. So that's largely what inspired me to have all the ships at Chintoka or many of the ships at Chintoka be so be salvageable because it would make sense in the logic of the weapon platforms with which they were programmed. Ooh, this is a tricky question from DB versus 2DB. Roughly speaking, how many Mirandas and Excelsiors did the Federation have by the start of the war, and how many were left by the end of it. In every battle space, there are at least a dozen in each formation, with most being destroyed at the end of every episode. They seem to make up a ludicrous chunk of Starfleet. Okay, so, yeah, there's an, there's an awful lot to unpack here. It's worth remembering that the Miranda and Excelsior were built for far longer than they probably should have been built, because it was during the Golden Age of Starfleet. Starfleet wasn't able to get the Centaur working, plus treaties with the Klingons meant that they also couldn't get the Centaur working because it would be a battle cruiser. so they had to stick with the Miranda. They couldn't build sort of new battlecruiser-style stuff, so they stick with the Miranda. And, you know, for most of the early half of the 24th century, you get away with it. And also, the Miranda is a very proven modular platform. That's the other half of it. That's why it stuck around and why it was built in so many numbers, is that it could be used by practically every single division of Starfleet. Similar thing with the Excelsior. They built these things in stupid numbers because, again, it wasn't a warship. There were an awful lot of other ships at the time that were being considered. Uh, stuff like the George Joe class, stuff like the Andor Mark II, which would have eaten into the uh, resources that were actually allocated to the Excelsior because Starfleet realized it didn't need a torpedo boat, it didn't need a battle cruiser because of the Treaty of Kitima, which means that they just build more and more Excelsiors. And then, even going into the Ambassador era, you know, Ambassadors are great, but you don't need them to do everything. And with the Federation constantly expanding, it's just easier to keep building Excelsiors, especially for all that busy work that needs doing. So that's why there are so many Excelsiors and Mirandas. It's also worth remembering that a lot would probably have been kept in reserve yards and, and surplus depots and were reactivated at the start of the war. By the end of the war, there will certainly be fewer and fewer. Not none at all, but you'll start to see fewer and fewer, especially when it comes to Mirandas. Because actual, because it's a cat, it's in a category which is easily replaced. That being destroyers, and by the end of the war, Starfleet has an awful lot of destroyers and attack ships that can do the job of the Miranda better 
the Defiant, the Interceptor, and the Saber. The Excelsior is in a bit of a different boat because it's this general purpose heavy cruiser. And the thing is, is that actually, they until they build the Excelsior Mark II, the very thick-necked one, they don't actually have a satisfactory replacement for Excelsior as a general purpose heavy cruiser. So that's kind of a bit of a problem. So actually, there's still quite a few Excelsiors by the end of the war. Next question from YF9856. How come Starfleet didn't exploit the breakthrough by sending an additional fleet to support the flanks and replenish capital ships? Uh, essentially, what happened was because they hadn't actually captured the planetary surface, there would be no point in trying to exploit the breakthrough because their line of supply was not yet built. You know, potentially, if they did lead a breakthrough, they could put a fleet through and, you know, drive a fair distance. But their support would relative would be relatively limited. It's worth remembering that at the same time that this battle is happening, there's also substantial action going on in the Calandra front. And that's all. That's where an awful lot of resources is being tied up. So actually, Starfleet doesn't really have all that many ships that it can spare to support this offensive. And because the planets were not yet properly secured, they couldn't then set up supply bases. And so any kind of push further into Cardassian territory would have been under-resourced and would have met with disaster because they would be outrunning their supply lines. This is why you need to capture planets, is so that you can bring your supplies right up to the front as close as you possibly can. Otherwise, you end up with delays in resupply, your resupply is vulnerable to interception and interdiction, and suddenly your position be can become very compromised very quickly. From SCP guy, did I make a new map? Because the new one, the one you show, has a larger DMZ and other things are different. Could you post the image of the whole map? Well, uh, I can happily tell you, I did not make that map. That was actually made by Geekius Maximus, and that map is, and that was a map he posted publicly on the Venom Geek Media Facebook group. So if you are at all interested in that map, go have a look there because it's excellent stuff really is excellent and I, I'd very much be interested in working with him in future, particularly for earlier periods with a different size federation. Next question from SCP Guy, where are all the Galaxy class ships? So interestingly enough, at the first Battle of Chintoka we see at least one Galaxy class, possibly two, but in the second Battle of Chintoka I went through and I reviewed the footage and there's not a single Galaxy class in that entire sequence. There's Nebula class ships, but there isn't Galaxy class ships. And the reason for that, the Galaxy wings are not fleet level assets, they are sector level assets, and they will go where they are needed. So it's very likely that because the Federation had been standing still at Chintoka for so long, that those galaxy wings were sent elsewhere where they could be more useful. You also want to keep galaxy wings moving around so that it's harder for the enemy to track them because they are a pretty critical asset. So that's why there weren't galaxy wings at the Second Battle of Chintoka. Not that they would have done much good. Next question from Gabe Logan. Can we expect some videos on KDF raids? Yes. Now, those will probably be specials, and those will probably be a special more broadly on the development of raids and raiding tactics across both sides of the Dominion War. But that is definitely something that I will be covering in, in future specials, because, well, as you see with the Dominion War in chronological order, there's still an awful lot of sort of spots where there isn't anything other than the month-by-month -month breakdowns. And I want to get that playlist to a position where there's something every between every monthly video uh, and possibly even more, depending on how much there is to talk about. So, um, yes, 
we will be talking about KDF rates. Next question from Species TO. You mentioned about Chintoka 3. There were at least 300,000 Cardassians plus militia that had blended into the civilian population. So how big were the cities on these planets? And was the Federation at all acquainted or experienced with large-scale urban warfare? Or were these not cities as we would know them on Earth, but a collection of small towns that were easier to control? It would be interesting to see a deep dive of Federation and Allied soldiers trying to fight an urban battle against Cardassian soldiers and citizen militia. It certainly would. Alas, Deep Space Nine never quite had the budget to ever portray that. Battles always took place in, you know, isolation where civilians and, you know, that all that messy aspect of warfare was far away. Uh, but in terms of the actual scales of the cities on Chintoka 3, they're not going to be Earth-level cities. They are not going to be uh, New York or, you know, or London or anything like that. They're going to be much sort of smaller settlements. You know, a city, city is a very broad definition, um, but a, a built-up urban center, certainly. Certainly something that is a key strategic objective to hold with, uh, you know, logistics and transport hubs. But in terms of being like gigantic, you know, huge cities, no. More, more akin to when you think about the coverage of the war in Ukraine. And there's an awful lot of places that are described as cities. Now, if you Google those places for their pre-war population, you would see that most of them, at least by Western standards, were not really cities as we would understand them because our standards of cities are very big. We have very big cities. So in terms of the size of the Cardassian cities, yeah, we're talking on the smaller size. Not villages, but probably what we would call large towns. Ah, Robert Hilton asks, In the Dominion War, October 2375, you recount the Breen attack on Earth in the first phase of the month before the 15th, starting with their limited operation. But in this episode, you recount that the attack on Earth was on September 25th. Was there some new information since your Dominion War episode, separate from this point, since there were 16 days from the time Chintoka was secured and the Breen attack on Earth? And six days past that, in this episode's narrative, combined the combined Breen Cardassian fleet uh, attack and wipe them out. Okay, so this is a timeline question. I'm not going to read through the entire thing because I'll I'll muller it. But essentially, I'm going to say that I made an oopsie uh, and that I did not remember when I actually placed the Breen attack on Earth. Uh, but so, essentially, we know that the Breen joined the war early October, put that in the 25th. I don't think I specifically say that they attacked the Earth on the 25th. So I wouldn't say that those two dates conflict. 25th is probably when they actually joined the war in terms of signing the treaty, you know, where we meet Thotgore. That that will be when the Breen actually joined the Dominion. But in terms of the attack on Earth, yeah, that is going to be some days later. So Again, any, you know, any time between the 25th of September and the 15th of October. But yeah, my, my judgment of time is not always the best. But the point is, is that they join the war, they attack Earth, and then there's the Battle of Chintoka. And the interesting thing to just bear in mind is that in the attack on Earth, there's no mention of the energy damper, which is very interesting. It's like they kept that one up their sleeve just for the Battle of Chintoka. So again, that's another interesting detail to consider for the Battle of Earth. Okay, final question from ISAF Ace. Several questions. Why did the Dominion often hold back the Jem'Hadar from ground battles in favour of Cardassian infantry? Well, to put it simply, Jem'Hadar are aggressive infantry. And the Dominion want to be very careful in terms of how they spend them because yes they can clone them and they are expendable but they're still very good and they're much more useful than Cardassian infantry for the work that the Cardassians are doing the Jem'Hadar are entirely inappropriate Jem'Hadar infantry are aggressive and should be deployed as such 
Cardassian infantry is much more linear and static in its deployment. And so, in that way, the Cardassians are far better used in defensive operations than the Jem'Hadar. The Jem'Hadar don't like being on the defensive, and they never train for it. The Jem'Hadar always train to be the aggressors. Always. They have that in common with the Klingons. So, using them in a defensive fashion is not actually that useful. Now, in the counterattack, having a counterattack reserve available for the Jem'Hadar, that is important. That is quite useful. But in terms of in the Chintoka system, that was very much confined to AR-558, which the Dominion actually considered to be the most important asset, not those smelly Cardassian civilians that are really just an inconvenience. His second question is, why did the Federation not deploy peregrines in larger numbers for close air support or use atmosphere-capable ships to provide transport and mobility and ultra-close heavy fire support? Um, so in terms of using... Uh, peregrines for cast that means that you have to have them now you would have them and peregrines would be conducting close air support however it's worth bearing in mind that when you have dampening fields and your transporter inhibitors and such even if the dampening field is not going to immobilize the vehicle it will blind your sensors and that means that you're flying into a situation where you have no real clue what's down there what's going to be shooting at you and also what you need to be shooting at. So dampening fields make close air support really quite dangerous and not necessarily all that effective. So it happened and basically once you were able to break a dampening field, if you were able to destroy the dampening field generator or dislodge the unit that had it, then suddenly a whole bunch of enemy units are, are no longer under the umbrella of the dampening field. Yes, absolutely. You go in with close air support and you strafe the hell out of them. But until that happens, close air support is very dangerous to the ones carrying it out and not that effective. And that goes doubly for using a starship. Again, it can be done, but it's not advised, especially not with any of the participants we're looking at. The Klingons might do it and the Jem'Hadar might do it, but again... That's in very much an aggressive fashion and not a mode of tactics that either the Romulans or Starfleet are particularly comfortable in. And if you're not all doing it, then it's very easy to just redeploy your units to counter what the Klingons are doing because you know that the Federation and Romulans aren't going to do the same thing because they're not nuts. Like the USA in the Pacific Theatre of the Second World War, why did the Federation feel the need to completely secure systems instead of blockading isolated and unpopulated moons and planetoids and launching regular airstrikes to degrade their resources? Well, for much the same reason that the US did so in World War II. The US in World War II had to do this island hopping in order to secure the routes towards the island of Japan which was, of course, their ultimate objective. And in terms of... And so securing the surrounding islands was very important in terms of providing bomber bases, supply bases, all that kind of thing, which was essentially to... You know, there was a plan to invade the island of Japan, and that was important. But in order to do so, you had to lay very firm foundations. You had to make a very solid checkmate. That's what I would really say is that you know in terms of war it's not enough to just put your enemy in check by you know making a single move use the chess analogy here you make a single move and you put your enemy in check and then they just move and then you check them again and then they move and that will go on until they run out of places to run or they end up countering your check and taking whatever piece that was doing that it's not a very quick and efficient way to win a war. Whereas laying a proper foundation, setting up your checkmate, many moves ahead, and then just simply moving a piece out the way and check and mate. That's really how you want to go about winning your war. Because in the long run, that will actually save lives and save resources that otherwise, if you just play this game of check, out of check, check, out of check, 
you end up losing more in the long run. So that's why taking planets like Chintoka is so important. It's setting up for that final checkmate. So that was all the questions from the Battle of Chintoka. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope I was able to provide satisfactory and illuminating answers. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And uh, I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members, my loyal navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella, and David Reeves, my dutiful commanders, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, JC Tech Wizard, Rizel 3D, and James C. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squad Recourse, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, Tobias Klein, Greg Martin, Shermos, and I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants, and we welcome Nineball Mark II and Donald Duncan. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.